It's been a long fight. That's pretty much the worst thing you could call a Native American person. You know, it's the equivalent of the N-word. It's the, it's the way that the Native kids get targeted on school grounds. I, I certainly did. We're not seen as people, as humans, intelligent beings, people with rights. People give that argument, oh, it's only a mascot. But then you turn to that person in real life and you can't see them outside of the cartoon figure that we see in mascots and the stereotypes that are presented. The Native Americans had no voice for the first 40 years of the existence of the franchise. And at the point where they began to gain a voice, uh, they began to attack. The moment of change came because enough, enough people had a concern. It was not only a Native American issue. I'm a season ticket holder of this team and go with my brother to every single game. And so I support the team. I just don't support the use of this name. I think it's wrong, it's derogatory and racist and not fair to continue to use it. The name sucks. We need to get rid of it. Change the team's legacy. That, that, would be, uh, that would be in the first paragraph of any story summing up his ownership years from now. End of an era, the Washington football team is officially retiring its name and logo. It felt like an extraordinary victory, but it was also very sobering to look at all that it took to force that name change. This national uprising, the, the biggest um, investors in the NFL coming forward and saying, you know, you have to do this. It shouldn't have taken all of that to change this name. Being able to change this name gives you an opportunity, at least symbolically, to break free of the negative part of your past. You can always keep the positive. Like, no one's going to take those Super Bowls from you just because you changed the name. You're still that same franchise. But symbolically, I think you can break free of some of the negativity. This is a long-standing exhibition at the National Museum of the American Indian called Americans. And it really is looking at this deep connection between Americans and American Indians. And what the exhibition shows is that Indian imagery and names are constant in the United States, that people growing up here, they've seen these images and names from their earliest, from their earliest days. States, weapon systems, sports teams, food, it's all around us. But these aren't actual Indians for the most part. They're, they're fantasies, they're representations, usually well-meaning. But they speak to something very deep, which is, this goes back to the very beginning of the country. So we think all of this stuff, even though it seems silly, a motorcycle named Indian, you just don't see a motorcycle named Negro. You know, it just doesn't happen, right? I think what's really subversive about how this happens is it's not like a big discussion. It somehow just sounds right to name the Cleveland baseball team the Indians um, or the Washington football team the R words. It's so common, no one thinks, well, how come we don't describe Asian people this way, you know? Why, why is it only Native Americans? And of course, it's always meant to be positive. You don't name a sports team or a weapon system for something you despise. It's meant to be heroic, you're valorizing it. So that's why people would say, oh, let's name our, our football team after a group of people who are known to be great fighters. And you're respecting them in a way, but at the same time, you're not seeing them as fully human are three-dimensional and also, and this is really crucial, it's always said in the past, it's never about the fact Native people exist today or part of the 21st century. So it relegates us, that's what all this imagery really does. You don't see pictures of 20th century or 21st century, and it's always going back to the past. It has always been derogatory, and I will not say that word uh, in this interview, the R word. The history of that word 
comes from an era of time where there were bounties put onto the scalps of women, children, and men from the 1700s, 1600s, where there were the red, the red skins. Now I'm going to say it because I want you to hear it in its context. The red skins, the bloody red skins. And so instead of bringing the whole body back, um, they could bring the scalp back. Often scalping or the cutting, this is graphic, the cutting off of the um, top portion, portion of someone's head um, skin is, is actually was the way that they could prove it. So there is a very deep history to that name that, that goes for centuries and then was also used even in modern and contemporary times. Even to this day, um, I hear from friends, from family members who had an incident or many in their lives of being called the dirty R word and how that shaped their feelings of of shame, aloneness, and the plummet of self-esteem uh, that can cause, can lead to such incredible self-harm. We know that this is also rooted, these issues are, are rooted in studies that are done uh, of how it affects Native. The, the real activism around mascots emerged largely in the 1960s. And uh, it started first at the universities. Uh, the University of Oklahoma gave up its little red mascot and uh, it's the Stanford Indian was, uh, was done away with, the Dartmouth Indians were done away with. And at the same time, uh, the activists were targeting, especially the Washington football team because of that, that, that word. It's been a constant, you know, sort of rising and falling. There was also protest uh, movements uh, that happened physically and in the spaces at the at the stadium, and that started in the early mid 1980s. And uh, many of those people are actually un unsung heroes, uh, both Native Americans in the area and allies, uh, starting from, from the early 1980s of going to the stadiums and protesting and having people scream at them, throw drinks in their faces, curse them out. I mean, and, and doing this over and over and over again. We know that there was the the trademark cases starting in 1992. We weren't suing for a name change. We were saying the federal government is sanctioning this by granting exclusive privilege of making money, exclusive trademarks to the Washington team. And they can call their team any old racist thing they want but the federal government should not sanction that racism with a grant of exclusivity and making money. And that was our case. And we won that. We always knew that in the end, uh, the Washington team in particular was never going to change its, um, change its brand uh, unless that brand were devalued. And so much of the strategy attacking the trademark, you know, and, and um, and attacking the team in general um, was an effort to uh, to reduce the value of the brand, and, and hopefully, you know, they would see that there was uh, they could make more money by changing the brand rather than holding on to it. It is a racial slur. There were repeated uh, legal strategies, um, and even when they were successful, they were struck down. Right now at six, a new era for one of the oldest teams in the National Football League, Washington's football franchise, known has known one name since the 1930s, and that's about to change, facing both corporate 
and societal pressure, the Burgundy and Gold will be retiring its team name and its logo. I think on the day that it was announced that they would be changing the name, that it felt like a victory. And I think a very well-earned victory by the many, many people who before me and around me have worked on this issue in their spare time. I think where we led up to that moment in July of, of um, 2020, when um, the sponsors uh, started to pull out and because of the response uh, to the murder of George Floyd. And there's a moment where a spark turns into a flame. Sometimes you just have to hold on to something long enough and keep going with it because it's the right thing to do that when the larger uh, picture changes, it's there and ready for when we have that moment. It really kind of it mirrors a, a lot of all of American history in that uh, you had a name that was originally racist and then it got appropriated into society. And then there was prestige added on top of it when you think about the Joe Gibbs era in particular and, and the three Super Bowls and really becoming a marquee franchise in the NFL. And so everyone kind of attached excellence to the organization, excellence to the brand, excellence to the name even. And so it softened. Uh, but um, history has a way of, of, of coming back around. And I think just as the franchise has evolved over the last 20 years and all of their issues have been brought up and as society's um, kind of temperament and uh, sensibilities have changed, uh, I think kind of all those wins got swept into this conversation and it didn't happen specifically because they wanted to change the name and they had this epiphany you know it was just a collision of a lot of societal factors that forced dan snyder to do it the bittersweet part is that it, it took money to do it it didn't take morals it didn't take notions of let's not be racist anymore it took money to make the team change their name so in this exhibition in our museum, we've really tried to have this idea of blame the sin and not the sinner. That Native people are sports fans, many of us. Many of us who live in this area, we, we want to support our team because fans have, you know, are opposed to it or have mixed feelings about it. We try to be sympathetic to that and say, okay, we hear you. But this really does cause damage. Sports teams do change their names. Hey, Washington Wizards, that wasn't long ago. That used to be the Bullets. I heard a lot when they first decided that they were gonna get rid of the name and just go through this period. Um, people would talk about, we well, are trying to erase our history. You know, pff, this is not erasure. Uh, Doug Williams doesn't vanish as if Thanos snapped his finger in the Avengers just because you're going to a new name. You know, this is an opportunity to start something new, to start fresh, um, to be something better. And I hope that the franchise takes full advantage of it because I do think as controversial as it was having that name as, as, and as controversial as it was changing that name, there is going to be a new energy. I think you also have to acknowledge that there are people, including, you know, thousands of fans for whom the former name of the team does not evoke racist stereotypes, behaviors, thought patterns. They think about John Riggins and Joe Theismann and Daryl Green and Art Monk, right? And you have to acknowledge that, that everybody who was a supporter of the team is not a racist because they like the team. <laughs> You know, and so there's there's been, you know, decades of uh, branding with that name that for many people is positive. Now, that doesn't mean you ignore the people for whom that name is incredibly racist, negative, creating bad feelings, all of that. Right. You have to. Both things can be true at the same time. Here's the thing. 
Um, it shouldn't be that hard to, to give a team a name and a nickname and a mascot. Like there, there's only one real rule. <laughs> uh, well, well, two rules. Like it has to sort of like have an image of like classic sports toughness. You, you want people to be afraid of you when you play them, especially if you're a football team. But the second one and the most important thing is don't be offensive. <laughs> um, if you accomplish those two things, it doesn't really matter what your name is. And here's the other thing with it. If you win immediately under this new name, no matter what it is, people are going to say, wow, like that's the presidents, that's the Armada, that's the commanders, that's the Red Hogs. Uh, they will be super excited and they will buy all the apparel anyway, but they'll buy extra uh, if you are, you know, once again, one of the class teams of the NFL. Here's another interesting thing is that some of the worry uh, or uh, apparent worry that was put forward was to say, well, if we don't have the mascot names and you don't have the images, even the stereotypical ones, then Native people will be completely erased from from the national consciousness and maybe that's better than nothing and so now we have um secretary interior deb holland the leader of the national park services needed we have native american representation on television in a huge way and so uh not having um ourselves represented as somebody else's derogatory stereotype does not erase our presence. It actually opens the way for us to um, be seen. A hundred years ago, the easiest thing to do would have been for them to just say, okay, you know, we'll stop being Indians. We'll, we'll try to be like the rest of you. We, you know, we're gonna give up who we are, but that's not what people do, right? People don't give up who they are. Identity is so powerful. They did what they have to, had to do to survive and to allow, you know, my generation and the generations uh, after to continue to be uh, who we are, you know, to identify as being citizens of our tribes and, and uh, saying that, that, that uh, we're different, we're not better, you know, we're part of you, but we're different. And, uh, and we just ask that that be respected.